welcome back to my channel i didn't film last week because i was feeling so 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 poorly i've missed you all hello and i'm really happy that i'm feeling so much better that this crazy week that i had is finally over so i thought it would be a brilliant idea if i wore my wine lovers bright pink t-shirt and take you through the five easy steps of how to taste wine. I always find it very interesting drawing a parallel between meeting a new person and tasting a new wine. First impressions are always very important, but of course, looks can be deceiving. Step number one. So with wine, one can understand many things from its color. So take this white wine here. It is clear, meaning that there is no haziness, there is no sediment, it's not cloudy, it's transparent, it's bright. However, some wines are not filtered, so they will keep a little bit of haziness in the glass. They are not going to be as transparent as this particular example. And there is really nothing wrong with that. It really comes down to you and how experimental and how adventurous you want to be with your wine. But please do not worry if uh, the wine is supposed to look hazy, if the winemaker actually intended this little uh, cloudiness to be in the bottle. And the other question that pops to mind is, what type of color is that? And we can learn so many things about the identity, the age, the origin of the wine. So it is important to take a really good look of the color. Ideally, in order to identify the color, you want to place your glass on a white surface on 45 degrees. The hue of the color is actually quite interesting. If there is a little bit of green, that might mean that the wine is younger. If the hue is much more golden, that means that the wine has a little bit of age to it or it has been in contact with air. If there is amber, that's definitely an indication of aging and the same with brown. It is important to remember that white wines actually get much deeper in color as they age, whereas the exact opposite happens with red wine. So the more aged a red wine is, the more transparent it will become. This one that I have here is a ruby, but it could also be a purple, a garnet, a tawny, or again, a brown. Step number two. The second step at wine tasting is swirling. And I have been told in the past that a few people believe that this is what uh, wine drinkers do when they want to look smart. But swirling is a very important step of wine tasting because what you do with swirling is that you allow air to penetrate the wine and help all its beautiful aromas to climb higher on the top of the rim of the glass. So when you put your nose in it, it's so much easier to catch them. When you have decided on the color of your wine, then it's interesting to assess its intensity, how deep the color is. A really good trick is to place your thumb on the bottom of the glass and then try and look through the glass and then you can check if you can see your thumb. If you can clearly see your finger, then it's a light wine. If you can somehow see your thumb, it's of medium intensity. And then if it's pitch black and you cannot see anything, then... You guessed it, it's deep. Well, now thinking about it, the second stage of uh, tasting wine, the swirling stage, doesn't really have many similarities to meeting a new person because if I met someone and I start swirling them, that would be weird, wouldn't it? Now we're moving on to step number three. Step number three is all about sniffing. And this definitely applies to meeting new people. certainly one of the most common questions that I get about tasting wine. How can you identify all these aromas? The only thing I get is, well, wine. But it really is so much simpler than it looks like. Please do not feel ashamed and make sure that you put your nose deep into the glass. I've noticed many people sniffing the glass like no, darling, you cannot smell anything from here. Yes, obviously, wine does smell like wine. No surprises here. But it's part of the fun, it's part of the game to identify which aromas, which hints, which notes do you get. And to make things a little bit simpler is to break everything down into small boxes. When you're tasting a white wine, you can check if it smells of citrus fruit, 
Does it smell like lemon or grapefruit or lime? Or is it more like a fruity scent? Peach, apricot? Or is it more like green fruit? Like biting a green apple or a red apple? Maybe a pear? It's actually the season of pears now, isn't it? I haven't had one yet. Do you think it's more like a tropical fruit? Like a pineapple, mango, banana, uh, passion fruit? Uh, well, actually, I have a really good story about uh, passion fruits. One of the professors from my diploma class told us that uh, a candidate could not remember the word passion fruit, so he wrote erotic fruit. Yeah. Okay, so enough with fruits. Say that there, you cannot identify any citrus fruit or tropical or green, not even stone fruit, but maybe it smells like flowers. With white wines, you can search for acacia, elderflower, chamomile, blossom. White wines can also be really herbal, like dried rosemary, dried oregano, dried tea. Some of my favorite scents. Mm. The red wines can also be floral. You can find some roses and violets in there. Mm. And of course, with red wines, when you start breaking down the aromas into categories, the first two that come to mind is either red fruit, like red cherries, red currant, red berries, or maybe black fruit, like black plums, blackberries, black cherries, bramble, black currant. You might identify some dummy aromas as well if the wine comes from quite a warm climate. Strawberry jam, plum jam, or even dried fruit like figs and prune. Red wines can also be quite herbal and you can smell eucalyptus, you can smell mint. So all these aromas that we have mentioned so far can go into our primary aromas box which are mainly the aromas that come either from the grape itself or the grape blend and the alcoholic fermentation. Many wines are stored and matured in barrels and when the barrel is new you can identify some sweet oak aromas coming through. Some of the white wines that have been left on its lees for quite a while they have undergone what it's called malolactic fermentation. Many people use the abbreviation of just malo to describe the aromas. Quite creamy, yogurty, pastry-like and brioche toast, very similar to what champagne smells like. And this gives to the wine this lovely, buttery, creamy, almost yogurty type of character. Many winemakers leave their white and red wines in big or small oak barrels. And this is when you get these lovely spices of vanilla and clove and nutmeg, coffee, chocolate, charred grilled wood, cedar, toast, butterscotch and even smoke. All these aromas from lees aging, malolactic fermentation and oak barrel aging can go into our secondary aromas box. And last but by no means least is our tertiary box right here. With tertiary aromas we mean all the aromas that come from maturation. When a wine has been left in the bottle for so long you might have tried wines that are like 10, 15, 20 years old and it's not uncommon that a wine needs to be left in its piece, in its bottle, for quite a while before it's ready to drink, because it is then when it really reaches its full potential. Just like people. Well, we're not kept into barrels, but sometimes it takes us a little bit more time before we liberate ourselves and reach our true potential. So thinking about white wine tertiary aromas, you can think of winter snacks. Yes, you heard me right, I said winter snacks. Because during the winter, all I snack on all day long, much more than I should do, is nuts and dried fruit. Hazelnut and walnut and almonds or marzipan, or even so, like dried fruit, like dried banana, dried apple, dried apricot. And when they are left in the bottle for quite a long time, the aromas and flavors can remind us of petrol and kerosene, ginger, bee wax, honey, hay, mushrooms. In red wines, you can also find these beautiful dried fruit aromas, like dried figs or prunes or cooked fruit. But also you can find these lovely, savory and earthy aromas, almost like forest floor, leather, tobacco, coffee. Some red wines can be surprisingly meaty. You can smell bacon, grilled meat, 
farmyard. Red wines can also be quite herbaceous, like blackcurrant leaf or tomato leaf, quite green, as we say, and we mean like green pepper. Actually, one of my uh, French professors always used to tease me because uh, apparently I always speak tomato leaf as one of my descriptors for red wine. And he always said, yes, yes, of course, we know tomato leaf, olive paste, you are Greek, we get it. <laughs> so now that we have covered quite a big selection of aromas and flavors, right? We have a ton of primary aromas to play with, so many secondary aromas and flavors to identify, and of course, plenty of tertiary aromas to pick from. Now, I think it's time for our fourth step, sip. If you remember from previous videos, I always try to keep a little bit of the wine in my mouth and inhale air at the same time, making this lovely noise. The reason I do that, it's not because I want to seem and sound disgusting, but it's actually helping me a lot in identifying the flavors in my mouth. You remember step number two was shrill. So what we did was putting air into our glass in order to be easier to catch all the aromas. And the same exact principle applies to the mouth. Just try and practice a little bit with water first because you don't want to have any unwanted incidents, let's put it like that, and then try it with wine. You are going to be amazed about the difference this little step makes. So let's see. What I personally like to do is to pause for a second and think, do I like this wine? Because really, this is the most important thing you need to remember. Would you like to drink it? Would you like to share it with your family and friends? Would you buy it as a gift? Would you like to receive it as a gift? And this is all that matters. Please do not be afraid to express your own opinion because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. Whether you enjoy it, whether you like it, whether you would like to share it with your love or your life or whatever. Would you like to catch up with a friend over a glass of this wine? If you don't, that's fine. There are hundreds and thousands and millions of bottles for you to decide which wine you actually like. So. So don't think that if you do not like a particular wine, you just don't like wine. But let's try this white wine. So first things first, is the wine dry? Does it taste more like a lemon or does it taste more like a melon? The first thing that really gets me is how much my mouth is watering right now, which tells me that the wine is really fresh, it has really lots of freshness and what we can otherwise call acidity. Acidity as a word doesn't really sound very lovely, does it? So I'll just call it freshness. And then the second thing that comes to mind is whether I feel a burn in the back of my mouth, because this is what alcohol does to you. You can feel a slight burn. If the wine is not too alcoholic, between 12, let's say 11 and 13% alcohol, you're probably not going to feel any burn. But if the alcohol is higher than that, then yes, you will suddenly feel the alcohol and maybe also perceive it as a tiny bit of sweetness. Coming back to our meeting new people parallels, we're coming to assess the body. So the other day on Instagram, I was talking about a wine that really impressed me. And I'm not exaggerating when I say that I still think about it every single day. I described its body to be so rich and so textured that it reminded me of squeezing a meringue. This is how memorable it was. The body of the wine can be really light, you know, like your typical down the pub type of Pinot Grigio, or it can be quite a full bodied, like an oak barrel Chardonnay, where it's really creamy and buttery. And then you can also discuss the texture. Was it silky? Was it smooth? Or was it really sharp? We can go again and identify all these beautiful primary, secondary or tertiary flavors. And now it's the perfect stage to note how long did these flavors last in your mouth? How long was the finish? Was it intense but really short, like a person that you met and you thought that you were madly in love with but you actually didn't really care? Or was it quite long, like one of your really cherished friendships? And there's also one more step, 
that it's not really part of the tasting wine per se process, but I find it very important, especially when I go to taste dozens and dozens and dozens of wines. Your fifth step, spit. First of all, when you swallow the wine, you get a little bit drunk and tipsy and you start mumbling and it's just not a cool look. It's not. And it's also really good for your palate because it doesn't get that tired. Obviously, if you are with your family, your friends, if you're out, if you're having dinner, I don't expect anyone to start spitting their wine. But when you attend a big tasting, I know it's a little bit weird and I know that my friends hated it when I first started doing it because they were like, uh, what are you doing, girl? Especially when you go to really big tastings, it is for your own benefit that you don't get drunk quite quickly and you can still write notes and you can still talk to people like the adult that you are. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. It was so much fun going through the five simple steps of how to taste wine with you today. I wish you all a fabulous weekend. Please do give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it and please do subscribe to my channel and I shall see you next week. Bye! Acacia, elderflower, chamomile.